A lot of the changes that Clemson fans were clamoring for, they're already happening. Coach Sweeney and the Clemson Tigers announced that two, two on-field coaches will not have their contracts renewed and will not be back for next season. That's defensive ends coach Lemansky Hall and offensive line coach Thomas Austin. I want to start off by um, just saying I want to be as respectful as I possibly can uh, in this video as I give analysis on that. So please don't take any of this to be disrespectful of them. I'm thankful for everything they did at – during their time at Clemson, Lemansky Hall was on staff for their Clemson's 2018 national championship, the greatest, you know, the greatest team Clemson's ever had. And Thomas Austin was a, a very good player for Clemson. So uh, him leaving in that regard is kind of, you know, bittersweet in a way because I, I did enjoy him as a player. That being said, I think the process to hiring these guys was poor on Coach Sweeney's part. I wrote an article about it. Um, unfortunately, I, I titled that article uh, very poorly. So for folks who saw that and were mad at me, I apologize for the title, which was that DJ Uyungle and Streeter were not a problem. We owe him an apology. Uh, I retitled it and and focused on, you know, I forgot what I called it, but, you know, let's find the problem or what was the problem. And, and I didn't talk about these two guys as being the problem in particular, but the process to get them where Coach Sweeney is either hiring friends or former players and using the uh, analyst pool as a farm system rather than just getting the best guy possible and using the analyst pool to as much value as possible. And I think Lemansky Hall hired in 2018. I don't know if he was the start of that, but I think it's it's the most maybe emblematic um, or illustrative of that. And that he came in in 2018. He was Dabo's friend and a teammate, one of the better players on uh, I think it was 92, the uh, Alabama National Championship team. But he was just coaching like linebackers at a high school in Nashville. He didn't have all this experience. And so it was really a friend hire. And, you know, they, they were expanding the roster or, or, or like coaching staff from nine to 10. And so they could just do that. Um, but it's just an inefficient use of resources. You're, not only are you using a lot of funds from the athletic department to pay these guys, but you only have 10 guys. Um, so you, you really can't afford to waste them uh, for recruiting purposes, but also for talent development. And I think with Lemansky Hall, you know, he came in in 2018. Obviously, they won the national championship, so he didn't break anything. But we didn't. He, he inherited Cleveland Farrell and uh, Farrell and Austin Bryant. They didn't get any better that last year. Um, and then from from after that, he had just a Maskell, who was a, a big time, you know, four star recruit. He had. Uh, Miles Murphy, who was a really, really big time recruit, had Xavier Thomas, a big five star recruit, they had Brian Brzee. And none of those guys got better from start to finish at Clemson. Maskell, probably the exception. I mean, he this was his best year, so I, I take that back. He was an exception, but he never got particularly good. He had one sack this season. He had, um, the, that's I think his only sack since the COVID year when he, he had some sacks against like Georgia Tech, but or no, he had a sack against Georgia Tech this year. But point being, he he was never a great pass rusher for Clemson, and I I personally didn't think he was especially good at setting the edge either. Um, and he was a big big time recruit that was at Clemson six years because Xavier Thomas is an even bigger recruit, and he was good. I, I'm not criticizing him. I, I like Xavier Thomas a lot, but for a five star to stay six years, he didn't become elite. Uh, he's not a you know shoe in first rounder. I'd be very surprised if he was a first rounder. Now there was a lot of extenuating circumstances with COVID there, so I don't totally blame Hall. Um, but then again, you look at Brzee. Brzee more of a defensive tackle, but played some end under under Hall. And his last year was one of his lesser years, uh, lower PFF grade. Again, extenuating circumstances with injuries and you know family tragedy. Uh, but Miles Murphy's there's no. Uh, no excuse there. He came in, his highest PFF grade was as a freshman, and it stayed about the same, but each year after that was very slightly worse. You certainly didn't see him make progress, and then he left, and he was still drafted in the first round because of raw you know, athleticism and talent and size, but you weren't really seeing development. And then you look at this year, and a true freshman, so you do have to give Hall credit for recruiting him, but T.J. Parker was arguably Clemson's best defensive end, him or, or Thomas, you could argue either one, but uh, – when freshmen are coming in and making an impact, it's, you know, the coach's credit to some extent, but also an indictment on the development of the older guys. And then I think something that played a role potentially, I, I, they certainly won't say this, but you have to wonder, did recruiting play a role or lack thereof in the decision to let Hall and Austin go? Darian Mayo is a guy coming in that I'm excited about. I think it's a good recruit. Uh, the other one is Adam Kisai. I'm 
if I'm pronouncing that right, Kisai, um, more of a more of a project, and not not someone that I had circled or or um, you know I'm super high on necessarily. So you you are now seeing a, you know the track record of development not being super elite, perhaps leading to getting a little tougher to recruit those guys. Um, and, and maybe Clemson, I think they should, I think they almost have to add, add a portal player this year to, to shore it up. And I think that's another commentary. So I do think that Hall, even though the defense was very good, I do think it is a net positive. I like him as a, as a guy. I'm not attacking his character, but I think this is a move that shows that Dabo is willing to let good friends go, do it in a respectful way, treat them with class, you know, pay the pay off their contract as they're owed, but to make the team better and continue to put winning at a high priority. I think that should be a really big encouragement because quite frankly, the last couple of years, I think a lot of fans, uh, a lot of people like myself were seeing moves made that didn't seem to prioritize winning. And, and I don't mean winning over doing the right things, you know, ethically, but hiring friends, refusing to use the portal and betting on guys, making big jumps when you have years of evidence of them, not case in point, Justin Maskell spoke spoke about him with a lot of confidence, really needed to go out and find a way to get a transfer at the end. Um, luckily, TJ Parker stepped up and you had a freshman fill the role. But there was a there was you were seeing some things where it didn't seem like Dabo was doing every single thing he could to win. I think we're seeing a shift. I'm really excited about the future of this program. The other, the other one was Thomas Austin. He was at Clemson in an analyst role from 15 or GA uh, 15 to 18. Then he went to Georgia State in 2019 and 2020. So he did get some external experience. He came back as an analyst for a year. And then in 2022, he was hired, <clears throat> hired as the full-time offensive. I have to give some credit here to my friend Tom Dianor, who's been on this uh, on this channel two, three times. And he was, I mean, I crushed him on our conference championship draft picks, um, which I should circle back on next week because I've got four teams still alive. But one thing he 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 crushed and was spot on about was when Thomas Austin was hired to replace Robbie Caldwell, he really lamented the missed opportunity to go out and grab an elite proven offensive line coach. You know, he, he said, this has been an area where we haven't been great. It doesn't make any sense to go get Robbie Caldwell's, Caldwell's understudy at a group that's never been that great. Um, and he was right. You know, I, I didn't, I tended to agree with his thought, but thought, you know, Robbie Caldwell has been good and all, but I'm excited to just get new blood. Coach Sweeney's had this plan. He does, you know, Austin does have external experience, so I'm not too worried about it. But I have to give him credit. He was completely right. It was a big missed opportunity. We saw Clemson's offensive line be wildly inconsistent this year. And the thing I look at is are players getting better and are we recruiting great players, right? And so this year, there's only one offensive line commit so far. Ronan O'Connell, a three-star out of Tennessee. I like him a lot. I did a video about him. You, you can check it out. Um, so I, I'm high on him, but those numbers are, as you know, that's not acceptable to just have one. So they will probably find a second now uh, to add to the class. But I think, again, the lack of uh, recruiting chops, or at least in this class, is the reason you see him gone. Well, conversely, um, Tyler Grisham hitting some home runs in the recruiting trail is probably one of the reasons why he was retained and Austin wasn't. Um, but let's focus on Thomas Austin here. I think the thing you want to look at, Coach Sweeney said Clemson is a developmental program. A couple things on that. A, I don't know how much you could still be a developmental program in the holistic sense of it. Um, you know, I think of developmental program. I think of Wisconsin a few years ago. you got to get some five stars that come in. You don't have to develop them. They're just already great. And now you got to get some transfers that just come in. You don't have to develop them. They're already great. So I don't think we could be a developmental program in the fullest sense of the word. But you do need to develop your players, especially if you aspire to be at least somewhat of a developmental program, as Sweeney definitely does. And so you look at the offensive line and the guys from last year, we returned a lot of guys. Now, to be fair, you know, there were injuries, right? Uh, Tate got hurt and Walker Parks got hurt. But even, even apart from that, you weren't seeing guys take big steps. You're not seeing guys make a lot of progress. Uh, you can even go back to Jordan McFadden. Sorry about that. Camera went out for a second. Um, you can you can even go back to Jordan McFadden. Uh, his highest PFF grade was as a sophomore. 
his lowest grade, 72.9, which is okay, uh, was in his last year. He was a little banged up that last year, but that's a theme. Um, and McFadden wasn't all, you know, Tom Austin, but it's a broader theme at Clemson for the offensive line that I think justifies going out and making a splash. Uh, you know, Austin was only here two years, so you can't put all, you can't put you know all of this on him, right? But Will Putnam, um, he's a guy who's big time recruit. Remember, he he was about to go to Florida State. He came to Clemson instead. Um, same same year that um, they were Florida State was about to add a uh, big time quarterback Drake May. Is it Drake May? No, excuse me. Big time quarterback Sam Howell. They're right about to add Howell and uh, and putting them, and they lost them both on signing. It was devastating for Florida State and kind of helped them bottom out. But putting them, well, putting them, he had a 67.7 PFF grade. It's his third best grade during his time at Clemson. His highest grade, a 70.5, was as a freshman. Uh, Blake Miller, last year he was a 71.8. This year, 72. So no jump, right? No no regression, but no jump. Tristan Lee, he has gotten better, but he was a 60.7. So big time five-star in the program three years, still not performing at you know big time level, right? So you're not seeing the guys develop. And if you want to be a developmental program, you got to have coaches that are elite at developing. Uh, and so I, you know, all respect to Thomas Austin for you know the effort he put forth. And his time at Clemson as a player, no disrespect to him at all. But I think Coach Sweeney had this idea of, you know, enriching the Clemson family by bringing in people who really love and care about each other. And I really respect that. But at the end of the day, you need coaches who are elite at their job tasks. And I think he's realizing that, um, you know, he's not going to go out and say he's wrong. There's no reason, reason for him to do so. But I think a lot of the criticism has been proven true. And this pivot shows that he's kind of acknowledging that. Um, you know, fans and uh, analysts and, you know, writers have been saying, you, you're not going to have enough talent if you don't use the portal. And if you're, especially if you're not using the portal, you better have elite coaches that are, you know, really, really elite at developing talent. I think he's he's making that pivot. So um, big, big reasons to be really optimistic. This is the most optimistic I've been about Clemson football in quite a while. Uh, making the changes necessary will Definitely be interested to see what they do to replace these coaches. I think on the offensive line, you've got to go out and make a big swing, invest big dollars, because this is not just a Tom Sauston issue. This is <clears throat> this is really akin to kind of the brand streeter hire. It was a problem. You brought in someone who's not bad, but you need to you needed to make a splash to fix an existing problem. Um, even if Tom Sauston, even if he's better than Robbie Caldwell, you needed to really make a splash. Uh, and they failed to do so. Same thing with Brandon Streeter. I thought he was better than Tony Elliott in that role as offensive coordinator, but they really needed to make a splash. They did it with Garrett Riley. I think they should and will do it on offensive line. And then Lemansky Hall, I don't know if they need to make a splash at defensive end uh, coach. I think you can even give it all to Nick Easton and, and, and maybe have a special teams coach or, uh, or split someone else out. Um, so we'll see what they do there, but that's, that's going to make for some really interesting off season content. So uh, a lot of reasons to be optimistic. Anyway, if you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel. Uh, if you're already subscribed, please like this video. I want to tell you thank you for subscribing as well. Um, so I hope you're as optimistic as I am about these changes. Be tuned. Uh, be sure to keep an eye on the channel. As I think there's going to be a lot more news coming in the next uh, couple of weeks here. So with that being said, go Tigers.